Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Jared Lloyd. He's a wildlife photographer and environmental journalist whose work takes him around the globe in search of stories and photographs. Most of the projects that Jared works on are centered on climate change, biodiversity, and coastal issues. He's worked on BBC natural history documentaries, PBS shows, and publications ranging from Audubon to National Wildlife. So first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thanks for being on the program. Yeah, thank you for having me here, Derek. It's an honor to be here with you. Well, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the notion of ocean wilderness. You wrote a, a piece called Ocean Wilderness is Disappearing, which I found very moving and, and important. Uh, what is ocean wilderness, and the oceans are so big, why do we need it? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a great question. Um, so I guess first we should define what wilderness is to begin with and kind of, uh, let's say, um, borrowing from the uh, the same sort of verbiage that uh, that was used for our own Wilderness Act. It's basically a place where humans uh, are just visitors. We don't remain and where our impact is uh, is pretty negligible in an area. And so um, so you're right. You know, the oceans are a very big place I mean, they take up to about 70 percent of the uh, of the surface of the planet here. Um, but what we have found is those areas that have been identified as ocean wilderness, they are actually, let's say, the hotbeds of biodiversity that are left on the planet right now. Uh, we're talking about unparalleled bio biological diversity, and especially when it comes to the large predators like sharks and whales, for instance, which are oftentimes, you know, kind of that uh, that canary in the coal mine, if you will, when we're looking at ecosystems or are we looking at at habitats. So. You know, when we ask ourselves, what's the, what's the point of wilderness? Why does wilderness even matter? I mean, I guess we're up against a challenge right off the bat because there's there's something of a gulf, I think, in uh, between various worldviews in terms of why anything really matters with the natural world. And so, you know, of course, on one hand, we have the kind of anthropocentric uh, worldview in which, well, why does it matter to me in that – you know, can I get more food out of this? You know, will there be more seafood? Can we make money off of it? Things like that. But on the other hand, the other kind of worldview is, you know, maybe we're not the most important animal on the planet. And so maybe wilderness matters and wilderness should exist just for the sake of existing. Um, and personally, that's uh, that's that's my my perspective on things. Um, let's back up a little bit. You said a thank you for all that. Uh, you said early on that these are biodiversity hotspots, the ocean wilderness areas. And yes. are they biodiversity hotspots because they are biodiversity hotspots or are they biodiversity hotspots because they are wilderness? In other words, was, I mean, some of the accounts I have read of, of how fecund the ocean was prior to being, prior to this culture doing what it does are pretty extraordinary like ships would be there'd be so many cod in the north banks that ships would have to actually be slowed down by the by the sheer mass of fish so what i'm getting at is are these wilderness areas biodiversity hot spots because that happens to be the biome that happened to have been not touched or are they biodiversity hot spots because they haven't been destroyed yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. It's uh, it's they're hot spots because they have not been destroyed. So they are really only hot spots when we compare it to the rest of the ocean today. And so you make a really good point in talking about cod, for instance, and uh, and just how numerous that species once was. So the areas that are classified as marine wilderness today are not done so because they are protected. In fact, uh, in a, in the in the study that I was working with um, or I was I was using to uh, you know for that for that essay that I wrote um, you know Kendall Jones actually identified that none of the areas that are technically marine wilderness or ocean wilderness are even protected today so um, it's their hot spots only because they've been untouched um, now there are some places in there that that do fall into um, into that category and uh, you know one specifically would be an area around the Galapagos Islands in a study uh, done about 10 years ago um, by National Geographic actually found this to this area to have the largest biomass of 
fish on the planet in this one area, and specifically, again, it was um, it was really in sharks, which is that uh, which are those kind of canary in the coal mines, if you will. So, um, so I think that the issue here is not so much that the rest of these areas are you know extraordinary places that you know naturally attract you know huge numbers of animals it's just simply these are places that we haven't destroyed yet that commercial fishing hasn't completely raped just yet that we haven't you know um, basically moved off or killed off you know the the large cetaceans with sonar testings and things along those lines so can you can you say when you talk about ocean wilderness First off, what percent of the ocean are we talking about that could be still considered in relatively good shape? And where are some of these places? And can you do a contrast between these places and some of the places that have been, been hit? Like is it one, three times as many fish or 50 times as many fish or, or however we determine? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um so of all the ocean, right? So remember we're talking about an area that takes up about 70% of the planet. Of all of that ocean, only 13% of that is now considered to be ocean wilderness. And within side of that 13%, only 4%. So we're talking like, you know, a fraction of a percent now um has any level of protections whatsoever. Um, and so in terms of what this looks like, you know, in terms of, you know, actual numbers of fish and stuff like that, all of that still needs to be what you might call ground truth. Um, you know, this is, this is ground, a groundbreaking study that was, uh, that was published this summer and, uh, that, that actually identified this kind of 13% chunk of the ocean. Um, so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of figuring out exactly what that means. But in that study, what they were looking at was not so much the exact number of fish per area or anything like that, they were looking at those areas that were the least impacted by people. And so it just so happens that some of these areas also happen to be heavily studied places, and we know them to have significant biodiversity. And uh, and so first and foremost, kind of we need to identify where some of these places are. Um, you can uh, let it suffice to say that none of them are around North America. None of them are going to be around the coast of Europe. Um, um, so coastal areas, especially in the northern hemisphere, you know, where most people live uh, and most of the civilization is concentrated, uh, you know, n um, none of those areas fall within side of this, you know, kind of designation of ocean wilderness. Okay, so wait, we're talking. Wait. Yeah, sir. Go ahead. No, no. Sorry to interrupt. But but that's especially horrifying because the coastal areas are where the most biodiversity is supposed to be generically. I yeah, mean, that's, that's right. When we had when we had the previous extinctions, every mass extinction historically has been associated with a change in in sea level, and that has to do with incredible biodiversity along the coast and the creatures who have to live, you know, at three to five meters below the grant below the water. Suddenly, they're 15 meters and they can't do it. And my point is, so if if none of these hot spots are near coasts. That's even more horrifying because oh, they're supposed to be the hot spots. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, that's a, that's a very good point, Derek. Uh, you know, it's um, it's it's pretty sad, and I think that you know. In this, you know, kind of really lies a concept known as shifting baselines. You know, the coastal areas are supposed to be those extraordinarily diverse areas, especially around, you know, estuarine or estuary ecosystems, if you will. And, uh, and I think just as each kind of uh, generation of humans lives and dies, if you will, uh, we've come to accept, you know, um, a, a much more what would be the right word uh just uh, a, a much more feeble a much more uh a much sadder a much sadder state of things if you will as uh, as what's normal so so when we look at uh let's take cod for instance when we look at cod today we've watched the canadian cod fisheries collapse over the last uh, couple of decades and the cod fishery in the united states is practically non-existent um but we look back a few generations prior to that and there was cod everywhere and so you know as uh, as each, as each generation is born into the world we kind of just take whatever the reality is that we're born into as uh, the reality of the way the world probably has been, you know, our, you know, since the since the beginning of the planet, if you will, and it's a very dangerous place for us to be in, especially in uh, in this age of industrial uh, fishing. 
So I interrupted you a while ago when you were saying that the 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 wilderness areas, the 13 percent, are not along the shorelines of North America or Europe. And then I freaked out and interrupted you. So can you go on? <laughs> no worries. Yeah, yeah. So most of those places are going to be very remote locations um, around the Arctic and the Antarctic, and uh, and again in kind of the you know distant uh, Pacific Islands. Um, so you know basically the further away that you can get from the let's say epicenters of this civilization, you're going to get closer and closer to those marine wilderness areas. It's just a matter of you know at this point in time uh let's say that our civilization has just yet to fully fully destroy those places and i think that's a really important point here to make that was part of the study is that they did not kendall jones did not identify you know say 13 percent of the the oceans as being places that have not been impacted by humans by any by any measure or by any means um so what they actually did was they identified those places that had the least amount of human impact. So when we're in a world in which plastic bags are now turning up at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, so the deepest place in all of the oceans, we're kind of past the point of having no impact on the oceans, if you will. And so these areas, just the farther you get from civilization, you start to get less and less and less impact. But you're never at a point where you're finding oceans or areas of oceans that are not impacted by by humans and industrial civilization. And what are some of the, I presume also, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of these areas that have suffered the least impact or least harm are also primarily outside of shipping lanes? Yes, for the most part. Um, shipping lanes happen to be one of the big uh, stressors that uh, they were looking at when they um, when they put together this metadata study. And uh, so a couple of the other ones, of course, agricultural runoff, um, you know, heavy commercial fishing, especially with demersal fishing, which is uh, which is kind of bottom trawling, if you will. So the type of fishing that's not just catching fish, but actually ripping up and destroying entire habitats in the ocean. Um, you know, kind of what we're doing when we're say catching shrimp for instance. Um, so there was 19 individual stressors that they were looking at, and what they did was just basically identify those areas that fell within the bottom kind of 10 percent of, you know, of areas that were being affected by these individual stressors. And so, yeah, shipping lanes was a big one. In fact, I think that was actually first on the list that I read. So is that is that actually suggesting that um, shipping shipping is – uh, the most damage so shipping causes more harm than, for example, fishing, or is that am I misreading? No, I think that's uh, that's uh, that's misreading just a little bit. I think it's just an, an immediately obvious one. So, kind of one of the challenges with um, with the ocean or talking about ocean conservation and stuff like that is the fact that. Um, all of that is actually going on below the surface of the water, and uh, it's a very low oxygen environment. It's not a place that we're in, and so we don't see what's happening, and so we make assumptions on a regular basis that everything's just fine. And so I think that in focusing you know, on shipping lanes at the top of the list there, I think that largely has a lot to do with the fact that it's in our face. It's something that we can see, we can smell, we can hear, and uh, and you know, and I think that we're able to relate to that a little bit better. Um, so so shipping, however, does not begin to compare to commercial fishing um, in terms of its overall impact on the you know marine ecosystems and marine habitats. You mentioned a type of shipping, I mean a type of fishing. I don't recognize the word, but it were, was was the word was that a way was that a different way to say bottom trawling? Yes, it was. It was and demersal. Demersal. I don't know that word. And can yeah, you, it's. it's industry jargon basically so you're right to say that it's bottom trawling so basically you're looking at nets that are weighted um so that way they it holds them down to the bottom and uh uh these these boats just start dragging them across the ocean floor or across the uh the floors of estuaries as they start scooping things up and one of the big ones of course being shrimp uh in which case we know with the shrimping industry for instance that 75 percent of all life that is caught with inside of those shrimp nets uh 
uh, is not shrimp and it's dead by the time they even get it onto the deck of the boats. So that means that one out of four animals um, that are actually caught by these shrimp trawlers are even shrimp to begin with, and the other 75% is dead and just kicked back overboard essentially. So you know, you're talking, you know, highly, highly, highly destructive practices uh, with demersal fishing. You know, one of the lines that has always struck me, and the line ends up maybe apocryphal, but it still works. The, that line from where one group of Christians was wiping out another, and uh, they went in, slaughtered a city, and but not all of them were heretics. And uh, the, the people doing the slaughtering said, kill them all and let God sort them out. <laughs> and that's always just struck me as a perfect line for, for like, bottom trawling. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's good. Kill them all and let the economic system sort them out. That's exactly right. But let's let's be just a little bit more specific on the bottom trawling. That not only are they are, are they killing all of these creatures, but since they're dragging across the bottom, they are um, destroying any any type of coral. They're destroying everything. I've heard it compared to clear cutting. It's clear cutting the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, that's that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, that's exactly right. So, you know, we tend to focus a lot on coral reefs just because, uh, you know, they're beautiful. Uh, they tend to be places that people like to scuba dive and snorkel. But really, it's any hard structure bottom um, ultimately is what's drawing fish in. And, uh, you know, fishermen like to say that uh, fish tend to congregate around structure, if you will. And so the majority of the oceans are actually soft bottom. So think sand or kind of clay or mud, if you will. Um, and only a small percentage is actually hard bottom, and it happens to be those hard bottomed area areas that hold the, uh, the vast majority of animals in the ocean. And these, of course, are the areas that we're targeting uh, for commercial fishing. And so when we're doing, uh, when we're bottom trawling in these areas, we're ripping up that that structure or ripping up that habitat, the very things that's kind of pulling animals into this area, and uh, and what's left is basically left to kind of you know fend for itself or just I guess disperse and try and find other habitats to exist in, which um, are becoming fewer and far between. So you you said there was a list of 19, 19 stressors, and you don't need to have an exhaustive list, but can you go through? Um, can you just list some more of them? Like sure. We got, we got shipping. We got uh, this demersal fishing, and then plastic, and what else? Yeah, plastic. Um, another big one was is going to be agricultural runoff. Um, so agricultural runoffs. These are uh, this is the stuff that's creating dead zones in our oceans. So you take a look at like uh, the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. Um, you know, outside of the the mouth of the Mississippi, you have a massive dead zone that takes up hundreds of square miles, uh, where there's basically no oxygen whatsoever because of this agricultural runoff. And so typically, what's going on, um, if you've ever heard of a of a plankton bloom um, that's more or less what's happening with these agricultural runoff areas so uh, you get a lot of nitrogen phosphorus potassium dumping into the water and of course that feeds uh, algae if you will and uh, algae once it runs out of that let's say um, temporary explosion of fertilizers it starts to die off and as it dies off it takes aerobic bacteria so bacteria that needs oxygen to break that stuff down and so as it, that bacteria bacteria kind of takes off in population uh, to break down all of that dead algae, it depletes the water of oxygen, and so you have dead zones, and so you have no fish, even though it happens to be, or it should be, one of the most, um, one of the most biologically productive areas in, uh, in the Americas. We have no fish in these dead zones. And I interviewed somebody about dead zones years ago, and at the time, I think there was something like 450 dead zones and in the oceans, and he said that there had been one that had recovered, and the one that recovered was in the Black Sea, and the reason it recovered is because the Soviet Union collapsed, and it was no longer economically viable to uh, do industrial agriculture in that area. And so the runoff stopped, and that was in the, so 89 to 91, you know, with the collapse. Sure. And um, that area has recovered sufficiently that there is now a local commercial fishery. And that was one of the most optimistic things I've heard in a while. That, and this is so obvious. It's like, um, how, do you, how do you get rid of these dead zones? Well, you stop creating the circumstances that lead to dead zones in the first place. 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. You know, it's it's kind of almost like Chernobyl. You know, the stories that are filtering out of that area now of uh, you know packs of wolves and uh, you know actually being one of the the wilder places in the former Soviet Union now, just simply because people stopped living there and it stopped exploiting the place. Okay, so we have we have commercial fishing, we have plastic, we have uh, shipping, we have uh, agriculture runoff. What are what are a few of the others? Uh, one of them is going to be sonar testing as well by the military, uh, and you know so that's ultimately going to impact any animal that is using or has evolved to use biosonar themselves. So we can think, uh, let's say, bottlenose dolphin, for instance, um, are going to fall into that category. And uh, and so you know anytime we have places that are undergoing heavy sonar um, along our coastlines, we tend to also see uh, wash-ups of of dead or dying dying cetaceans or whales and the it's not just the military it's also the um uh uh exploring for oil they use uh really heavy um they use sonar for to determine if there's undersea oil um and the just to give a sense of how loud and i'm i don't remember the exact numbers but i remember laughing pretty hard because oh 15 20 years ago there was a case in California where they were a judge was going to determine whether they would be allowed to set off these these geophysical blasts underwater, and everybody's doing all this talking. And at one point, the judge asked, "Well, I'm not sure how loud we're talking. Can you set off something in the courtroom that, that will uh, <laughs> let us know?" And nobody could because it ends up the noise was so loud that it would have probably killed everyone in the building it would have blown out windows for like a four mile radius it was i don't remember the numbers like 150 db or you know just some extraordinary thing this the, the basic was loud enough that your ears would start bleeding yeah, that's exactly right, I mean, and that's why the sonar testing, whether it be from um, from mineral uh, companies, oil companies, or the military, it's it's actually killing whales. It's because basically, you know, parts of their brains are exploding, or parts of their anatomy is actually exploding because of this. Um, so it's not just that it, they're being disoriented and ran ashore; we're actually finding them dead from uh, from physical injury because those noises are so loud underwater. Um, which it is enough reason right there to to stop civilization frankly yeah. um okay so a couple a couple let's go let's do a couple three more of the of the stressors yeah so to be honest with you um i don't know the entire list of all 19 that's fine. stressors we'll just do a couple three more well, that, that, that's that's what I've got to work with right there. Those okay. are the ones that were actually listed um, by Kendall Jones in his uh, in his paper. Okay, um, so I want to go a slightly different direction, and let's let's pretend that there was going to be some enforcement, which we'll talk about in a moment. But it seems it seems there's a fairly easy way to limit human impact on. Um, some mountaintop, some wilderness area that you make at the top of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And that's you simply don't put in roads. And you don't allow people to put in roads, and so people can only walk there. So that's an easy way to enforce that nobody's going to, to do anything. How would you – let's say that they were – what would be mechanisms for protecting these areas, and what would be legal mechanisms, and then after that, what would be physical mechanisms? Because – what are you going to do? I mean, I wish that the Navy would 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 go and stop bottom trawlers, but I, I don't see that happening. Sure, yeah. Um, so as far as legal mechanisms, um, there is a concept known as no-take zones. And uh, unfortunately, these protect, I think the statistic is, is something ridiculously small, like 0.0001% of the ocean. And uh, as the name implies, no take zones. You're not allowed to take anything from that. So we can kind of compare that to, let's say, terrestrial wilderness areas here in North America. Um, any wilderness area here in the, in, in the United States, you can actually go in and fish and hunt and things like that. Um, it's just you're not allowed to improve trails. There's not any road 
road building, uh, things along those lines. But in no take zones, um, it, it's exactly as the name implies. You're not allowed to take anything from that, whether it be fish or oil underneath the ground there. Um, so no take zones have basically they've they've been a very controversial thing since the the concept was first come up with back in the 70s. Um, but we've had decades of research now where people have or countries have put these no take zones into place, and uh, and we see without a doubt they actually work. It, um, you know, it's kind of like the the um, I think what did you say the uh, the Dead Sea basically. Um, in that if you remove the human elements and you remove the economics from a location in terms of you know commercial fishing, shipping traffic, things like that, uh, these ecosystems do rebound. I mean, you think about it, we're, I mean, you know, we like to say that we're in the sixth extinction right now. So the five previous extinctions almost completely wiped out all of life on Earth. And all it took was a matter of just eliminating or removing or stopping whatever that massive stressor was on the planet or on nature for things to slowly but surely rebuild. And unfortunately, here we are in the Anthropocene, the sixth extinction, and we happen to be that massive stressor. So in places where we, where countries, where nations um, are motivated to protect their coastlines with uh, and protect their reefs and things like that with no take zones, we do see a rebuilding of these ecosystems. So, so legislation along those lines does work. Um, are we ever going to see something like that here in the United States? I mean, technically there are a few no take zones. They tend to be far off the coast of California and uh, in, up in Alaska. Um, but uh, but for the most part, there's uh, there's always the economic incentive to keep nations like the U.S. from doing something like that. There's fishing lobbyists and the like that, and and of course oil and gas lobbyists that uh, that will fight that to to the end of days, if you will. Um, but as far as actual physical protections that you can put in place, other than just let legislative protections. Um, I mean, that's that's a great question. And that's one of the great challenges with all of this is because technically speaking, all nations only own so, you know, X number X number of miles off their coast, essentially. And so once we move, say, beyond the boundaries of U.S. waters, um, who owns that? You know, that, those are international waters right there. And so ultimately it would take, you know, a concerted effort by the global community to do anything to protect that area. And right now, as it stands, everybody is, uh, you know, just more or less acts in their own self-interest, their own, you know, kind of immediate self-interests, if you will. Um, and uh, and that's one of the big challenges of protecting any species, let's say, in the Atlantic Basin, such as bluefin tuna, no matter, regardless of the laws that we put in place here in the United States, you still have other countries like Spain, for instance, that uh, basically thumb their nose at those laws and catch as many bluefin tuna as they want. So I'm not really sure how we could go about protecting large swaths of the oceans outside of national boundaries unless all nations on Earth, or at least all nations that have a coastline in that uh, along that ocean are on board with the same uh, with the same idea. This is not a particularly this is this is not a realistic solution, but it's frankly the best use I can think of for a navy. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I want to back up a second because I live near one of those uh, um, no take zones, and. I can validate what you said about it being tremendously controversial. The the local fishermen fought it, fought it, fought it, fought it, and they're still fighting it. And that them fighting it has always seemed kind of very short-sighted to me because basically, in, if you want to look at this from a commercial perspective, instead of calling it a no-take zone, call it a nursery. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a very good way of looking at it. Because... In the long term, they're going to end up with more fish. This this will make, and once again, I care about the fish. I don't so much care about commercial commercial activities at all. But but even from that perspective, it's like I know that among the American Indians that in the in the eastern sort of central eastern part, for the most part, Kentucky was uh, preserved as a hunting ground, and and not as many people lived there as lived north and south of it. Because a lot of the local people, a lot of the regional people recognized that you need, and they would do this more generally, is that there were places where you couldn't fish, places where you couldn't hunt, times of year you couldn't hunt, because they knew that, 
like I'm, among the buffalo people, it's very, very bad if you killed a pregnant female. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's just basic um, taking care of your own future. But with commercial fishing, we just call it row and make more money off of it. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, so you know that's um so in the in the kind of realms of conservation biology, there's this notion of spillover, and it's always been kind of one of the the key arguments for these things like no take zones, and uh, and you can actually trace this idea all the way back to the creation of Yellowstone National Park um, in Wyoming. Uh, George Bird Grinnell, uh, he originally argued for the creation of this park uh, because it could ultimately become a big gigantic game reserve in which you know. Uh, species like elk and deer and uh, and bison would have, like you said, a nursery, if you will, and then they could then spill over into the surrounding countryside. And in those places where no take zones have been, um, you know, put into place, we are finding uh, spillover to to occur. And uh, and one one spot in particular that's kind of made a lot of headlines in that regards happens to be no take zones uh, around the coast of the Philippines. Um, again, it just happens to be an area that was protected a long time ago, and so we have decades worth of data to uh, to build upon to see that this is actually occurring in these areas. And what is the what is the trajectory of these marine wilderness areas? Uh, is I presume, as with almost everything else, that if they do this study. How, it, it, so it's 13% now, and I mm-hmm. presume if they do this study again in five years, it's going to be 11%, and five more years will be 8%. That's correct, yeah. yeah. yeah um, I mean, even in the study, um, the authors of the study said that, you know, it's those areas that actually fell with inside of the 13%. There's, for the most part, there's nothing protecting them. It's literally just a matter of distance from kind of the hubs of civilization. And so, you know, their, their uh, prediction ultimately was that as time goes by, as, you know, technology continues to improve, as we continue to, you know, put more and more and more money into um, oil and gas exploration, as we continue to advance, um, you know, kind of transoceanic shipping, that these areas are going to, you know, become, you know, uh, are, are going to start slowly but surely being lobbed off of that 13% wilderness area. You mentioned technology, and that reminded me of a conversation I had, oh, maybe 10, 15 years ago with an old, old timer fisherman, um, commercial fisherman. And he was complaining bitterly about technology and saying that. When he was young, um, yes, fishing had been a easier because there's more fish, but also more difficult because the technology wasn't there. And he said it used to actually take a lot of skill and experience to know where fish might be. But he said now with those sonar fish finders, it's it's. He said it doesn't give the fish a chance. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that that's kind of the case across the board with uh, with so many different kind of commercial pursuits, um, both from uh, the ecological perspective, but also from the human perspective. I mean, automation um, has slowly but surely allowed you know fewer and fewer and fewer people to do greater and greater damage um, across this planet, and uh, not only has it kind of you know, help speed up the destruction of the natural world exponentially, but at the same time, it's also, you know, hurt humans, um, you know, in terms of putting people out of work. So you think, you know, kind of like uh, old school fishing methods from the early, uh, let's say, 20th century or late 19th century are going to be vastly different than the kind of the industrial scale fishing methods that we have today. Um, you know, one of the things I always think of, you know, here on the East Coast um, is the Minhaden fisheries. Minhaden is this kind of small, stinky, oily fish that's, um, from an ecological perspective, is considered to be the most important fish in the world um, because it ultimately is the basis of the uh, the marine ecosystem. So I shouldn't really say the world, but I should say uh, the most important fish in the Atlantic Ocean. Basically, they eat phytoplankton, um, which is means that they're one step away from eating sunlight, if you will. And uh, it's um, these things are used in everything from the production of omega-3 fish oil pills to fertilizer.
Budweiser. So if you ever buy a bottle of Fish Emulsion, uh, Motion, excuse me, it's um, it's typically Menhaden to even uh, lubricants in industry for machines and stuff like that. And so the uh, the Menhaden fishing fleets, uh, they basically consist of this gigantic, massive floating factory. And when they find these schools of Menhaden, they drop uh, boats off of either side. Now, you know, I can say boat, but to give you a perspective here, we're talking basically small ships that are being lowered down into the water that are, you know, 50 to 75 feet long. These things then take off and corral schools of hundreds of millions of Menhaden, and they corral them up with a gigantic net, and that big kind of floating factory then pulls up beside uh, this corral, and they just lower down a hose, this gigantic vacuum hose into the water, and they just start sucking up, you know, millions and upon millions of pounds of life um, into the holds of the ship. And so you think about like what that looks like today, and the number number of fish that we're able to remove from the ocean so quickly and so effortlessly compared to back when maybe it was say six guys with a with a net that they hauled in by hand um, I mean it's just you know what we're able to do the impact that we're able to have on not just the oceans but you know in all aspects of the natural world it's just it's just unbelievable it's simply unparalleled in history right now I really hate this culture <laughs> And let's 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 talk about why Menhaden are so important. Um, like, if they weren't being sucked up by the millions and tens of millions, what would be happening to them? Who would who would who would be? I love this line by John Livingston that there is no surplus in nature. Yes. So yeah. We like to pretend that we can just take that with no effect, but the truth is, every body, everybody, and every body is someone else's food. So if the Menhaden aren't taken by us, who 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 eventually eats them? Yeah, that's a great question. So so basically every fish eating predator in the ocean, uh, in the Atlantic eats Menhaden, if you will. So we're talking about everything from striped bass and bluefish to dolphins to ospreys to bald eagles that live along the coast to uh, many different species of whales. And so yeah, there is no such thing as a surplus. Um, it's it's interesting when you have a species that uh, that kind of you know grow or evolves in such a way to where there's you know an extraordinary number inevitably you have other species that then evolve in tandem with that um, to take advantage of that same scenario or to take ad advantage of that you know incredible abundance and uh, kind of across the board abundance begets abundance in nature so when you have something like uh, the Menhaden for instance you know we can look at most of the Atlantic Ocean, or at least most of the Western Atlantic Ocean, especially, uh, takes advantage of of those guys. Um, and so it's it's interesting. So in the winter time, you know, where where I'm at right now on the coast of North Carolina on the Barrier Islands, um, you know, the uh, the stripers happen to uh, um, happen to be one of the kind of the big commercial or excuse me, big game fish, if you will. And fishermen know that when the stripers come through, um, you know, everything kind of breaks down into layers, if you will. You have the stripers on top and then below them are the bluefish that are then taking advantage of, you know, the leftovers that uh, a menhaden that have been stunned or, you know, injured or whatever as it slowly but surely filters all the way down to, you know, to the bottom of the ocean where the smaller creatures then kind of feed off of their dead bodies down there. So literally it's the menhaden in the Atlantic Ocean are the building blocks of the entire marine ecosystem. And uh, luckily most states have actually outlawed um, fishing for menhaden, um, but but Virginia and Louisiana still allow it. Um, I think there's one particular company called Omega Protein um, that's based out of Reston, Virginia. That's uh, you know more or less at the at the helm of the Menhaden destruction now or the, the decimation of this species. Um, and you know it doesn't sound that awful. You know one single company at work now. But again, if we put that into perspective of what the Menhaden industry actually looks like with floating warehouses, if you will, with these giant hoses just vacuuming up, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds of these fish at a time, um, you can see, you know, it doesn't take you know, a diverse, uh, a, diver a diverse, you know, uh, set of businesses working at this. You know, one company can ultimately drive this species to or towards extinction. Which, by the way, is also, I mean, that, that's how capitalism works. I mean, no matter what, 
no matter what the industry is, it works toward consolidation and yeah. it works toward um, centralizing who gets to uh, who gets to destroy some either you can call it a resource, you can call it a natural community. Um, and I keep thinking about this this thing a, a friend of mine told me about. Her ex husband uh, was from Bangladesh, and when he was a child, his mother would say to him. Uh, you know, go to the river and catch fish for us for lunch. And by the time he was, he, he left Bangladesh in his 20s, um, the, the river was so polluted it was dead, and they got their fish from commercial fish companies in Iceland. And the point being that it seems that both of us, or at least for from, from me, but it seems like it for you too, our primary concern really is the natural world. But that doesn't alter the fact that you know, we can talk about all these other creatures being able to um, eat the, the menhaden, but the truth is that, that individual subsistence people could have either then caught the menhaden or their or the predators of the menhaden. So this, this, as you mentioned earlier, this trickles down to harming. I mean, if, if the coasts are going to be destroyed, then this means that subsistence fishermen along the coast are also going to lose their livelihoods or their or their or their means of gaining subsistence. That's exactly right. Yeah, they are. Um, this this you know it's uh, it does affect you know society at large. It does affect humanity at large. And um, uh, too often we we kind of get you know stuck in the idea that you know uh, this is America and uh, we're the masters of the universe and only uh, only you know our decisions and our well being actually matter. But there's still a you know a halfway decent size of the you know of the the global population of humans that still live on a subsistence level and do not have the uh, the same sort. Of impact on the natural world that you know industrialized nations like we do have, and our actions here and now are ultimately affecting them down the road, and uh, and so. What happens if, let's say, one day, um, you know, there is a, I don't know, a magnetic storm, a solar storm or something like that, it wipes out electricity, um, wipes out, you know, civilization as we know it, you know, I mean, we realize that, you know, these big kind of events do happen on a regular basis um, from the perspective of geological time. What happens then? We've, you know, we've denuded the ecological um, or the, uh, you know, the, the the biology along our coasts, you know, we're unable to to sustain ourselves and we slowly but surely watch as the vast majority of humanity just kind of snuffs out if you will so it's it's definitely bigger than just what's going on here in north america so two things about that one of them is that the county i live in in northern california has a population i don't know of 20 or thirty thousand, and the kalawa lived here sustainably for twelve thousand five hundred years Mm -hmm. And this is a, this is salmon territory, and of course the salmon are completely hammered. But my point is that um, I just recently, within the past couple of years, found out that the population in this particular county was like fifteen thousand. That's how rich it was. That they could fifteen thousand people could basically subsist primarily on salmon, also some elk and sea fish, but I mean seafood, but um, but primarily salmon. And that's how rich it was. And now, if if civilization collapsed, um, or when civilization collapses, there's no way this place can support 15,000 people. No, absolutely not. And and then the other thing is that, I mean, I love the natural world, and, and my work comes out of a love for nature. But honestly, in many ways, my 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 environmentalism emerged out of a fundamental conservatism. Um, by which I mean, it just even when I was a child, when I was six and seven, eight years old, it seemed really stupid to um, destroy, for example, a great run of salmon when you may need to eat them tomorrow. It just just seems remarkably stupid to me. Uh, absolutely. And you think about it, like um, I think that's a, that's an interesting point you make. You know, the the population of the area that you live, you know, twenty, thirty thousand people, um, and historically, or let's say to the prehistorical kind of era, it was roughly the same thing. And I guess you know one of the big differences now is that you know we're 
uh, you know, in terms of our seafood, you know, we're shipping the vast majority of, it, excuse me, the vast majority of it, you know, to other countries. It's not even being consumed inside of these local communities. And so, sure, you know, um, twenty to thirty thousand or fifteen to twenty thousand, whatever the number was, maybe that was a sustainable number of people in that area. Um, but you know, even though. Um, you know, our coastline support however many millions of people now in the United States. I mean, we're ultimately, you know, for the sake of the almighty dollar, of course, um, we've commodified nature and now we're taking that commodity and we're trying to sell it to the rest of the world as well. So, you know, that 20, so that, that 15 to 20,000 population there in your area, um, ultimately that salmon at some point in time then came to, you know, uh, people then started trying to feed millions upon millions of people with that same number of salmon that were spawning in that area well that's one of the problems is that i i don't understand how we can still pretty much consider ourselves sentient when this is a story that we have seen so many times there were more passenger pigeons than every other bird in north america combined and they sold them cheap for food in the big cities and there is and the same with cod the same with salmon the same with lampreys the same with you name it it's a menhaden, evidently, mm-hmm. that um, no amount of wild fecundity can survive infinite global demand. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the scary things I think about this um, this you know kind of the social push, if you will, to bringing up. Uh, let's say the rest of the world to first world standards of living. Um, you know, it, it's it's it seems cruel to say, but uh, but that's that's just a terrible idea. You know, the rest of the world should you know we shouldn't be living like this. Let alone the rest of the world. We need you know I forget what the statistic is, but I think they you know something like we would need three additional planet Earths to be able to support our way of life here in the United States if the entire global population lived that way. I think it's like 15 or 20. I think oh, it's more yeah. than three. <laughs> there you go. So we have just a couple minutes left, and I, I think you've done an absolutely wonderful job of explaining the need for for leaving some places alone in the ocean. And what you've got all these people who are going to hear this. What do you want them to do with the information that you're giving them? Yeah. Um, what do you do with the information? Um, well, you know, uh, I would like to say vote. <laughs> um, not entirely sure how uh, how much that makes a difference in, uh, in you know, kind of the – given the global economics of all of this. Um, however, um, individuals do matter, and grassroots – campaigns and direct action campaigns do actually uh, make a difference. And so I think that, uh, and I apologize, there's a a jet flying overhead right now. Hopefully um, you can still hear what I'm saying here, but I think that ultimately it's going to take everybody kind of pitching in and trying to find, you know, let's say, or fighting this battle on, you know, a hundred thousand different fronts, if you will, um, to uh, to hopefully protect the, uh, the oceans. I think that that's a great point, and also I would like for listeners to um, just imagine that jet that they hear now and magnify that by, what should we say, 10,000, 100,000 yeah. times more loud? Uh, I was saying easily 100,000 times. So 100,000 times louder, and imagine that, um, imagine that sound instead, and that's what you've got for cetaceans right now. And everybody else, frankly. I've heard about I've heard about not just cetaceans, but I've heard about fish having their swim bladders explode. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um. So. So, thank you. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about marine wilderness areas, or about this culture at large, or about nature, or anything else that I haven't given you the opportunity? Um. No, I think that uh that that was a pretty thorough interview there. So I would like to. Thank you so much for being on the program. I'd like to thank you for your work in the world. I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Jared Lloyd. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. 